All right. Well, everyone, it is 12 o'clock. Welcome. I'm Sarah Hanwald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development for One Schoolhouse. And um, my colleague, Peter, and I are absolutely delighted to have Celeste Payne here with us. She has been a um, just a stalwart, I think, in terms of our Thursday afternoon meetups, asking good questions and offering sage advice to other participants. And Peter and I said, Celeste, you have kind of an interesting and unique job. And Peter knew a little bit more about this than I did. But um, we just knew that other people would be interested in this role of faculty leadership and how it pans out. So Peter, do you want to take a minute and just say hello to everybody? And then I know you've got some questions for Celeste. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. And welcome, Celeste. Uh, I've been I've been fascinated by the role of faculty leadership and faculty voice for a very long time. Uh, once upon a time, I was the elected dean of faculty at a school, which uh, is a position that came with, with certain challenges, and we'll maybe be talking about some of those today. But uh, I, it's just interesting to me how schools uh, communicate and work with and support faculty members and whether that's whether that's with regard to you know benefits or uh, personal support or of course there then there's that whole matter of uh, of teaching and learning and how how faculty are supported there so when uh, we knew we had celeste who will i will ask her to describe her her, her role her her one of you know about 300 roles that she has at we want your entire school. life story in a quick paragraph <laughs> yes <laughs> so um i if i didn't say so i'm peter gow i'm the independent curriculum resource director at one schoolhouse anyhow uh love to just sort of jump right in with uh, with celeste and maybe the first thing is to uh ask celeste to explain her role as upper school faculty clerk at West Town School in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Peter, for, for having me here today, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, West Town School is a pre-K through 12 Quaker independent day and boarding school just outside of Philadelphia. And the role that I serve in um, that we're talking about today is the faculty clerk role. Um, Quaker schools um, have a connection with Quaker meetings. And in a Quaker meeting, instead of having someone who sort of presides like a priest or a minister, um, you have a clerk who actually takes care of the business. They didn't do anything in terms of sort of the religious service. A number of French schools, including West Town School, have a clerk role, which at the school typically involves at minimum running the faculty meeting. And so I'm the individual. We do not have administrators who run our faculty meetings. I run the faculty meeting and ultimately I'm the person who sets the faculty meeting agenda. Um, we have three divisions and so we actually have a clerk for each of the three divisions. And so I stepped into the upper school faculty clerk position at the beginning of this summer. Um, and this is my start of my 13th year at West Hill. Wow. Um, exciting timing, I would say, is that. So, so Celeste, can you, can you talk about just sort of generally what it's been like to be a faculty leader in this year of, of the COVID pandemic and this year of, uh, of considerable, I, I like to think that it's awakening with regard to issues of social justice. So uh, I'm going to step back to the spring. So the, the faculty clerk position at our school, um, it, it comes about through a committee of faculty members who bring forward a name and it's approved by the, the full faculty. Um, and I mention that because I was approved as the faculty clerk um, nine days before we went uh, into distance learning. Um, so the, the timing was just so that I knew that this was going to be my reality. And so I worked with my immediate predecessor who actually was transitioning to administrative role in the school. He and I worked closely together through, throughout the spring. 
Um, the other thing I should mention is in addition to my role transitioning, um, our principal also transitioned. So we have a new principal as of this summer and she came from outside of the school community and outside of the friend school community, which is an important piece to know in terms of, of all of this. So um, as distance learning began and thinking about COVID, uh, a number of the things that I started thinking about during the spring and have continued to think about during the summer is what do faculty need um, and what do the faculty want? And at the end of the day, I consider my role as the faculty clerk as serving the faculty. I'm not serving the administration, um, even though I report technically to the principal um, or to the dean of students, depending upon the role, other roles I'm serving in, I am serving the faculty. And so I've kept that in mind. Um, normally in any other summer, um, there, there's absolutely no communication from the faculty clerk until we're ready to start the new school year. This year is different though. And what I figured out that faculty need is they need information. And so uh, we have had three meetings over the course of the summer. The most recent was actually this morning. Um, the meetings, the first meeting was just simply about schedules. The other two meetings, resources, sharing resources, having Q&A, having a listening session for faculty. Um, and each of those, the last two meetings have been an hour and a half to two hours long. Um, colleagues have thanked me. So I think they've been useful. They've served their purposes in terms of helping colleagues to know as we transition back um, to the beginning of the school year to think about what we are doing. And I should say as information for everyone um, at my school, um, the upper school where I am serving um, is a day and a boarding school. And so we have international students and the decision was made approximately two weeks ago that we would be in distance learning this fall. So that's informed a lot of what I've done. Um, the other two divisions at my school only have day students from the immediate area. And currently they are planning to open in person. And so um, I understand that our division is in a different place even from the other divisions at my school. And so thinking about that, thinking about what faculty have needed has very much guided me through thinking about COVID as well as thinking about the upcoming school year. Wow, thank you. Uh, one of the <laughs> questions that uh, that we've had and that I've had, and uh, maybe it's, it's a combination of questions. So some of the challenges of being uh, in this situation, or really even in normal times, the challenges of being the faculty's voice with administration. Uh, when I know when I talked about my role as, as dean of faculty, uh, having been elected, people assumed that it was all about uh, advocacy and, and, and conflict. Um, there was a little bit of that because that can happen, I guess, in schools. But what are the what are the challenges that and, and and what are how do you how do you put that role together? How do you frame that role when when you have to explain to uh, uh, people outside the school world and and you know the things that you spend your your time and energy as as faculty clerk uh, on? So certainly one of the challenges I I alluded to a little bit earlier, which is um, so my. Of all the administrators, the one that I work the most closely with is the principal. So she and I uh, meet weekly um, and will continue to do so once the school year begins. Um, and that continues to be an important relationship in terms of sort of understanding where faculty, what, where they are, what they're thinking about, and perhaps things that the administration is thinking about in terms of uh, pieces they need to, to share with the faculty. Um, I am, since I am still a faculty member, I'm not an administrator, um, the upper school principal um, is my supervisor. Um, so, you know, I still, I, re I report to her. I am a classroom teacher um, also. So, you know, certainly in thinking about that. Um, the Dean of Students is also my supervisor in thinking about the roles that I have in the residential life program. So, 
um, I have that in mind, but I also have to, um, I don't know if set aside is not necessarily the right phrase, but I have to sort of focus on what's going to serve the, the faculty. Um, and so thinking about certainly my own individual piece, trying to set it aside um, at appropriate times in order to think about colleagues as a whole, what may serve them. And one of the challenges um, at our school is the upper school is the largest division. We have a, um, our full-time faculty is probably around 50. You add in part-time people, um, our dorm parents, some of whom work in other divisions, some of whom work outside of the school completely. That number then grows to about 80 people. Um, so people who are full-time, part-time, classroom teachers, non-classroom teachers. Um, and having a division um, that has a different student body, particularly thinking about boarding students and international students, and faculties work with them. So because we have a boarding program, we obviously have um, evening and weekend responsibilities. And so thinking about even those needs um, for, for, for faculty. So there are a lot of things that I need to keep in mind as I'm trying to advocate for faculty and thinking about um, the pieces that, that are going to help support them. And, you know, faculty members, of course, many of them have families. Um, they have children, they have uh, partners, spouses, pets. All of those are, are individuals important to them and also weigh into sort of thinking about um, their quality of life. And so thinking about what, how can I help them um, be able to do the best job that they can, but also then um, be able to walk away at times and to enjoy their time uh, away from school. So um, that's something that continues to be on my mind. And I would say sort of the, the, the final piece in terms of challenge is just the transition piece. So um, it's a good challenge um, to, to have you know, new voices, um, new perspectives to think about. I will say in, in terms of my role, because I'm just stepping into this, um, one thing that has been true is I rely upon the wisdom of my predecessor. So my immediate predecessor, um, he is principal of one of the other divisions. And then um, there are still three other colleagues who are still at my school who have served in my role. And I certainly go to them, uh, ask them for advice. Um, and I also have the support of what we call steering committee. So several other faculty members who have been also approved by the faculty who help me in thinking about the faculty agenda. So what you're describing is, is such a, an important, it's really a culture, it's not just a role. Uh, and I, I love that you have regular meetings with the administrators who are there because that means that you're not just you're not just carrying problems or issues, that it's really an opportunity to build that two-way street of communication, and then to have the wisdom of predecessors available as well. Um, it, it seems like a, you know, I think to a lot of people listening, that this may seem like a, a very, very much an ideal situation where there really is back and forth and there's an official channel for back and forth mm -hmm. rather than those casual meetings in the hallways and all, all of the other things. Uh, one of the things that I, I have to ask, and uh, if you, uh, Celeste's signature file lists about 17 different jobs that she has at the school. Uh, I don't know where she finds time, but I'm wondering, so you are, you know, along with being the upper school faculty clerk, you're the upper school diversity coordinator, you're a science teacher and uh, have a role in helping out the lives of day students. How do you balance all that, Celeste? And, and how, does the, how does the school help you in, in balancing that? I think that's an extraordinary set of roles. So uh, one of the things I, that, you know, I'm very cognizant of that and, um, Interestingly enough, so when I was um, named to this position, so the 
the clerk of the, of the, we call it the naming committee, came to me and, and said, are you interested? And so we had a conversation. And um, during that conversation, I said, I am very self-aware that one of the concerns that will come up are the, the number of responsibilities that I have. Um, and um, as my name was approved, so I was not present for this conversation, but um, that was, that in fact was brought up by my colleagues um, and uh, is something that I continue to be aware of. So um, each of these roles, um, there are colleagues certainly who, while they don't have official titles, are certainly there to support me. There have been colleagues even before me stepping into this role have said, you know, I'm, you know, I'm invested in, for example, DEI work. How can I work um, with you on this? Um, and so that, that certainly um, is a, a form of support. And then also, um, I, I try to be very present in the moment as I'm meeting with, for example, day student prefects. I met with my day students, student leaders um, earlier this week. Um, hearing what we talked about sort of the upcoming school year. How are we going to create a community um, for, for day students? And so, you know, thinking about those pieces and also um, being decisive. And I say that because, um, you know, when there's a number of decisions to make, particularly with different roles, it's easier to go ahead and make the decision. Certainly there's thought that goes into it. Make the decision and then try to let it go. We talk about um, during our faculty meetings, we can have very difficult conversations. And the idea would be when we're, we're having these conversations, these discussions, that you bring your message forward and then you try to let it go. Meaning you let it go to the rest of the faculty for them to process, that you're not trying to sort of hold on to a particular opinion. Um, and so I, I try to be decisive and then, and, and then move on. Um, it's not that I'm not invested, that I don't care, but I also know that, um, that there are also a number of other things in front of me that are important. And then, you know, finally, I would say, you know, taking care of oneself. And so two things that I've been pretty intentional about and very much so as we have had distance learning are um, getting adequate sleep. So I have sort of my start and stop times um, in the morning and in the evening. And then um, I take a walk. I'm fortunate enough to live on my school's campus. Um, we have a lot of acres. And so um, in the morning, I, um, I'm walking by 620. I take a two and a half mile walk and that helps me to clear my head. Um, it just improves my mood and it's a good start to the day. Plus I get outside. And so those are all important things um, for me to be able to do the job that I do. Wow. Well, that's, that's incredible. And uh, I, I'm glad that you're up and taking that walk in the morning. That's a, an idea we should all probably uh, I <laughs> pick up. Too, <laughs> based on that. Can I, I want to ask a follow-up question to that, if you don't mind, before I go on. So I can see that your role, your roles, you are really a mentor to a lot of different people mm -hmm. in different ways. How do you draw boundaries when, um, and we're doing a course right now for counselors about when are you a school counselor and when do you need to refer? someone to a professional and the same thing happens with school nurses, right? Like you help a little bit and then it's like, okay, you gotta go talk to your doctor. Mm -hmm. So how do you draw boundaries for yourself of, you know, this is, this is the right amount of support for this to come from me. And then now I need to, you know, some people may need counseling. They may need to go see a counselor. And I know that, you know, schools have benefits and that, but how do you help yourself with those boundaries? And did you get, um, did you get any formal training in that? And I it's okay if not. I'm not. That's yeah. not a credential question. I'm just curious about it. Question first, because that's an easy one. The answer is no. No formal training. Um, but I've I've also with time and and I've been in independent schools now over 25 years. Um, I've started, you know, as with each role and each school, um, it's become clearer sort of what's within sort of my 
my range of expertise and when I need to, to reach out to others. And, and uh, you know, by virtue of the fact that I've been here a number of years, but also in various roles that I've served in, I've gotten to know colleagues um, across the school. And there are colleagues, by virtue of their title, they have expertise. And then there are colleagues that sometimes people don't know their background. And I know, like, did you know this person has done X, Y, and Z? You should go talk to that person. Um, and sometimes people don't know that. And so sometimes it's just me connecting them um, with the, the right person. And I think colleagues, they, they appreciate being fully seen. Sometimes it can be very easy that we're only seen for the title that comes you know, in our email signature and folks don't know all the other things that are out there. And so I'm, I, you know, I will point colleagues in the direction of other colleagues. It's like, you should talk to this person. I think they, they would be interested in hearing about these things. Um, or I'll bring that person's name up with another colleague. It's like, have you talked to so-and-so about this? I think you know, the two of you um, would have an interesting conversation. So um, certainly I, I, I try to do that um, where at all possible. So that really comes back to Peter's observation that this is deep, you're deeply embedded in the culture of your school and this, this model is really embedded. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I've got a question from a, an attendee that mm -hmm. I'll ask before I move on to mm -hmm. a, a larger question. And that is, does the clerk role come with a stipend for the additional work? Um, people are curious. There, there is no um, financial <laughs> stipend that comes with it. Um, with each person who has served clerk, usually they look at their overall responsibilities and they, they try to adjust things accordingly. Um, I will say, I will acknowledge that um, because of COVID and being in distance learning um, and being in distance learning during this upcoming school year, that we are, we're in an unusual time and certainly all of us um, at many schools are being asked to do additional things. Um, and I knew that going into this. Um, and, and I also know that when COVID ends, and I know that it will end eventually, um, that, that certainly will be in a different place. And so um, I can't speak for other schools. I don't know in other schools' cases if there is either a financial piece or perhaps a course reduction piece um, as a result of it. Um, at my school, there is not. Wow. Well, I want to ask a question about one of the other hats you wear, because you didn't just get COVID this year. In your role as upper school diversity coordinator, we are now knee deep, neck deep, hopefully, and over our heads in some cases, I think we have to admit, in this very urgent and long overdue work around diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, all of the above. And this, while we're also just trying to figure out, gosh, how do we open school? What are the nuts and bolts of this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of balancing, balancing those two incredibly urgent and important critical concerns. And I'm just wondering whether <laughs> um, there's any advice you might give, um, you know, we, we have to give ourselves permission to do this work because it's maybe more important than uh, getting through the, the whole textbook in some cases. But how, any thoughts on, on how, well, maybe it's how, how you and how Westtown are gonna be balancing this work? So the, the, the thinking about DEI work and social justice work, um, for me, um, it even predates me stepping into this role. So one of the um, other things that I do, I have the honor of serving on the advisory board for Teaching Tolerance. Um, Teaching Tolerance is an organization that's connected with the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, they have a mission to develop resources, whether they are um, sort of print resources, electronic resources, webinars um, that support classroom teachers in thinking about anti-bias work, whether it's race, ethnicity, gender, 
um, all sorts of topics. Um, and that's something that I've, I've served in that role for the past five years. And so some of the work that I've done with other educators across the nation has informed sort of my, my approach and how I, how I think about um, social justice work. Um, first of all, I think it's important for everyone to be engaged. Um, it would be difficult, particularly if an institution is naming that this is important work for, for the institution to do, for not to have all the employees um, invested in it. Um, and so, you know, what does that look like? Um, you know, are there, is there professional development available? Um, now that I'm in this role as faculty clerk, um, interestingly, and I, I should say that DEI work was a priority even I, before I stepped into this role, because I'm also the person that sets the agenda, I can I do so with the DEI sort of lens informing that. Doesn't mean that's everything that we're talking about, but I know that that's an important piece of what we need to um, talk about. Um, and at those times when it's appropriate, and I've, I've talked to my predecessors already about this, I said, there will be times I need to present to the faculty as the diversity coordinator. Um, and when that's the case, um, typically I set aside, sort of step aside from my faculty clerk role. One of my predecessors will help clerk the meeting if there's questions and answers or things of that nature so that I can focus on that role. And so um, I'm able to be able to, to do both of those things. And um, I'm lucky to, to be able to, to be in that position. And I would say also that my school um, thinks that this is important. Um, I think it, one of the other things I would say is um, holding yourselves accountable. So finding a way that both individually and collectively you're holding yourself accountable. And so I started working with different groups at our school. We have sort of our leadership groups, our department chairs academically and on the residential side. We have a student life leadership team, which are dorm heads international student coordinator, myself as diversity coordinator, dean of students, um, and then we also have our class deans. And so starting to work with each of those groups, and I sit in each of those meetings talking about what are our priorities for the year? Um, what questions are we going to use to guide us? How are we going to hold ourselves accountable? And how can we return to, um, you know, questions again and again and again in terms of Okay, so what have we done during, since our last meeting to help meet our goals in terms of DEI? Um, what worked well? What do we need to improve on? And what step are we going to take before our next meeting? Um, none of this work happens overnight. And there's no destination really in this work. It's continual work. It's a, it's a journey. And so having ways, having structures in place to help move you along because it's very easy to get distracted um, by sort of something that's, that's very urgent um, and, and to say, oh, we need to attend to this. And then you end up sort of not attending to other things. And so what are the structures that you have in place to be able to um, keep your eye focused on that? And by me, meeting with these different groups, I can help remind folks, okay, so what are we, how is this helping us to meet our goals in terms of thinking about DEI and social justice, and where do we need to move to next? Um, the last piece I'll say is certainly your students at your school um, are an important resource. Um, at Westtown, um, our students are an important voice, and oftentimes when we are making faculty decisions, one of the questions that will come up is, what do the students think? And so the students um, have helped us to know in lots of ways, very explicitly, this is important work. Um, and when I say students, it's not just students of color, students from marginalized backgrounds. There are lots of students saying, we want to talk about this. We want to this is important to us, not just in the classroom, but all of the time. How can we, how can we continue to talk about 
important things like this. So it's really the culture. Mm -hmm. And it's so important. And what you've described, the, the structures and the, and the permission that you and your school have given to everyone in the school to pursue issues of importance and to, and to create avenues for doing that. Uh, it, it's, it sounds amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but the concept of getting everybody involved in the conversations around stuff that matters, it's not rocket science. We just have to do it. And uh, I, I'm so grateful to you for being here today to talk about how, <laughs> how you've been uh, playing a part in this conversation at, at at West Town and hopefully other people will uh, take away some inspiration because I'm taking away inspiration and I work for one schoolhouse so I work at home but this is just amazing thank you Sarah thank you <laughs> Celeste thank you so much and I'm really my I'm, I'm thinking in my mind already that I'd like to have you back because I have a feeling that there will be schools who will see this and think how do we get started Right. If this is a voice or a structure that we don't have in place now, you know, this is a hard time to get something started, but I bet there are some steps. Mm -hmm. Right. And what you've described is, I would say, informal, but highly structured in the sense that there are paths. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. We are out of time, but um, thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Celeste. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And